Oil prices crashed to negative $35 per barrel. What caused it, and is it an investment opportunity? Hello and welcome back to the Wall Street Petting Zoo. This is our This Week at the Zoo segment in which we discuss the last week's market news and make predictions about the coming week. I'm Christopher Smith. And I'm Robert Coburn. Monday was the day where we saw oil prices tumble. First it fell below to single digits, then to less than a dollar, then it turned negative. It bottomed near negative $35 per barrel. It was incredible to watch. Oil has since recovered. But what do negative prices mean? Why and why were owners of crude oil having to pay people to take oil off their hands? Yeah, I was glued to my computer all day. This was one of those once in a lifetime history making. And I had a Facebook thread going where every time that oil hit a new low, we were, it's now cheaper than a can of beer. It's now cheaper than a pack of gum. I mean, it was, it was something to watch. I've never seen anything quite like it. Um, but I did do a lot of research on Monday to figure out why this was happening. And so I think I can give a rough explanation for our listeners here. So uh, to trade physical oil, you have to have licenses in order to take physical delivery of oil. And you also have to own physical storage space, which I assume is pretty highly regulated. So I saw lots of jokes about keeping oil in your swimming pool, but I'm pretty sure that's not legal. Um, so most speculators on oil don't have licenses or storage space, so they can't actually take the physical delivery. So they trade futures contracts. And basically, a futures contract is something that says, it's a contract that says, I agree to take physical delivery of X number of barrels of oil on a certain date. And in this case, the delivery date was May 20. And whoever owned the futures contract on the expiration date, which was Tuesday, April 21st, had to then take physical delivery of the oil on May 20, which was the delivery date. So the, the expiration happens a month before the delivery date. So the way that you play this as a speculator is you hold the contract for a while, it increases in price, and then you sell the contract back to the market before that expiration date so that you don't have to take physical delivery of the oil. And the problem here was that on April 20, all of those speculators who were holding contracts with no intention of ever taking physical delivery tried to sell those contracts back to the market. And there was like a billion dollars worth of these May 20 futures contracts. And there were no buyers because there was no physical storage space left. So there's still some empty oil, empty oil storage space out there, but it's all sold off already. So like the buyers in the market who are actually actually have the licenses to take physical oil didn't have anywhere to put it. So you had this massive supply glut out there with all of these speculators desperate to offer it, offload their uh, futures contracts because they can't take physical delivery and there was no demand. So they're basically paying people to take these futures contracts off their hand because uh, they legally cannot take physical delivery. So uh, that's basically what triggered that Monday price collapse. Isn't there another expiration date coming up on May 29th and then again on June 19th? Yeah, actually, um, uh, April, April 29th and May 19th, um, there are expirations coming up. So April 29th is this week. That will be on Wednesday. So, yeah, we could potentially see this happen again. Um Although I think the market is already adjusting to sort of make sure that it won't, it, it at least won't happen on the same scale again. But uh, yeah, the Brent futures contracts do expire this week on Wednesday. So we could potentially see on like Tuesday, a similar kind of thing happen as speculators once again, dump a massive number of these futures contracts on the market and we see no buyers. So uh, it, that's certainly a possibility. Um, it, this last week, it was WTI oil. There are two oil indexes. These are the WTI oil uh, contracts. And the ones that expire this week are the Brent oil contracts. So we saw this week on Monday, the WTI oil prices collapsed, but the Brent oil prices stayed relatively stable. So if it happened again this week, it would be the Brent oil prices that would collapse and probably the WTI oil prices would stay relatively stable. So if it does happen again, it would probably be this Tuesday. That's something to watch for this week. Now, Chris, after the oil wars in the 90s and the 2000s, you know, what we grew up in, did you ever 
in your lifetime ever think that the price of oil would be negative? I mean, a single sheet of toilet paper was more expensive than a <laughs> barrel of crude oil. What does that mean for gas prices and airliners? Does that mean it's a good time to invest in oil? I I certainly didn't think we would see those prices. I, I didn't think we would see like $5 oil. So <laughs> negative 35 certainly was not a, uh, not on my coronavirus bingo card. Um, honestly, it's probably not a great time to invest in oil. Um, the spot price of oil came down, but as I mentioned before, only people with licenses and storage space can take advantage of that. The rest of us only have access to futures contracts uh, and and oil company stocks. And the prices on those did not drop like the spot price did. In fact, oil stocks actually ended the week at a much higher price. They Oil was like one of the strongest performing sectors this week, despite the huge collapse in oil prices, because Trump announced Tuesday morning that he wants to give them bailout money. So the spot price of oil is cheap, but the futures prices and stock prices still look kind of expensive. Um, and I wouldn't really want to get into this market anyway, to be honest, because I just did my taxes and discovered that the oil stocks that I traded last year are really, really complicated on my tax return. Um, and oil futures are the same way. So I, <laughs> I just would not want to deal with that on my tax return again. So I'll probably stay away from oil producers and oil futures. I think that those end up being uh, more annoying than they're worth. One way that I am playing the sector right now, though, is tanker stock frontline, which I've talked about several times on the podcast, um, and it has been a very strong performer for me. As I've mentioned on the podcast before, oil tanker booking fees are sky high right now. And now that oil storage is full, uh, the oil companies are using tanker ships as floating storage. And so they're paying the same booking rates for these oil tankers. But the oil tankers don't actually have to go anywhere. They can just sort of sit and chill, which reduces the cost for the, the tanker companies. So the, the market for tankers should stay really strong as long as storage is at a premium. And uh, Frontline still has about a 15% dividend. So it still looks cheap in terms of the dividend that you get paid. And I saw this week that uh, I think it was a Nordic tankers um was talking Nordic American tankers or something like that was talking about how he's never seen the tanker market look this strong and their company is basically just making hands over fists. So that's the way that I'm playing all of this oil stuff is kind of the, uh, the, this tanker play. Yeah. Earlier this week I saw the, uh, I saw a picture and I, I sent it over to you that all the tankers in the world that are just like sitting there with just oil reserves sitting on them, just on different ports all over the globe so uh it's very eye-opening in terms of you know how many oil tankers are out there uh and i also had a friend of mine ask me it's like uh he asked me it's like oh is it now a good time to invest in oil and uh i was like well you can't really invest in oil per se and he even mentions like well what about an oil company so i said uh, even if you look at the oil companies right now they don't they don't look like they were affected almost at all by uh prices of crude oil going negative uh as you stated like they actually ended the week higher than the beginning of the week because of what trump did um so okay let's dig into the rest of the week's news because there was actually a lot that happened this week despite the huge collapse in oil prices on monday the s p 500 only dropped about 1.75 percent uh we got a bigger drop on tuesday though when it came down three percent and on Monday, it was just the oil futures contracts for May delivery that dropped in price. The June futures contracts stayed pretty strong, but on Tuesday, we saw the June and July futures contracts drop quite a bit as well. So partly the market came down on the weakening oil outlook. But on the other hand, there was actually a bunch of good news on Tuesday. Trump announced that he wants to bail out oil companies, and we got some really positive earnings reports from companies like Netflix, Snap, Chipotle and Coca-Cola. The Senate also passed another $500, a $500 billion stimulus bill for small businesses and hospitals. So the market responded to all the good news by rallying on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we also got a positive earnings report from AT&T. Yeah, the technology companies have definitely been doing really well this earnings. They have been pretty consistently beating the analyst expectations. I can't, though, say the same for airlines. Delta Airlines posted a big loss on its earnings report on Wednesday, and United Airlines announced that it's uh, trying to raise a bunch more cash by issuing a bunch of new shares. 
which dilutes the ownership share of current shareholders. So if you hold shares in United Airlines and they issue a bunch of new shares, then you actually own a smaller proportion of the company after that share offering than you did originally. So uh, it it really dilutes the value of your shares. Yeah, I believe the numbers was like 39 million shares was what United Airlines was uh, selling for like 25 bucks a pop. Uh, I think that went through Friday. Um, Grocery Outlet did that this week too, issued a bunch of new shares. Yeah, that's definitely a risk in this kind of environment where all the companies are desperate for cash. Um, in Grocery Outlet's case, it's probably a good sign, at least for the health of the business, because there's so much demand for groceries that they don't have enough cash to stock their shelves. Um, one thing about the cash shortage is that even though the Fed is printing trillions and trillions of dollars, uh, we have seen the dollar stay strong. So the dollar, as we've mentioned before, cash is king and the dollar remains one of the better performing investments out there. Yeah, we got, we got some good, we got some more good earnings from tech companies on Thursday and Friday. Texas Instruments and Intel both beat analysts' expectations on their earnings reports. However, both of them also posted weak guidance for the next for the next quarter. Another big earnings winner on Thursday was Domino's Pizza. They had a they have had a great year so far. Yeah, yeah, the earnings picture this week looked uh, fairly good for the most part, uh, but the economic data on so good. There were 4.4 million new jobless claims, which was slightly worse than expected, not horribly worse than expected. Um, but we have now officially wiped out all of the jobs added since the end of the last recession. Um, so unemployment basically is back to where we were uh, at the end of the last recession. And there are these indexes of economic activity called PMI. And so we got manufacturing and services PMI this week, and both of those showed huge contractions record levels of contractions in services and uh, the the contraction in manufacturing PMI was the worst in 11 years. So pretty bad numbers there. We also saw new home sales drop 15%, durable goods orders drop 15%, consumer spending drop 25%, new auto sales drop 32%, retail sales drop 9%, and US airport volume dropped a whopping 96%. Ouch. So really bad, really bad for the airline sector and not looking great for the rest of the economy either, frankly. Yeah, plus we're seeing a lot of bankruptcies out there. This week's bankruptcies included Unit Corp and Valeris, which are shale oil drilling companies. I also saw that another shale driller suspended operations in a Norwegian oil company called Equinor slashed its dividend. 24-Hour Fitness is also considering bankruptcy. Yeah. Uh, one thing I read this week is that wave of retail bankruptcy coming. We've already seen it with, uh, you know, J.C. Penney's is working on bankruptcy. Several other, Neiman Marcus and several other retails are working on uh, bankruptcy settlements. Um, but there may be, uh, you know, dozens more coming once the economy reopens. I think people are generally expecting that the reopening of the economy will be great and it will prevent bankruptcies. But actually in the retail sector, in order to go bankrupt, you have to hold a liquidation sale to get rid of your inventory. So uh, I saw that like these bankruptcy lawyers were saying, actually, a lot of retail companies are waiting for the economy to reopen to do this, to, to declare bankruptcy and do restructuring because they have to be able to do those liquidation sales. So it's only when they're able to re reopen their stores that they will be doing their bankruptcies for retail. I suppose that's going to be a long list. And the last big piece of news here was that Gilead, Gilead's COVID-19 drug that everyone got so excited about last week failed in its first clinical trial. Also, we posted a record number of new coronavirus cases in the U.S. yesterday, so it looks like we're not actually, quote-unquote, past the peak of new cases. Yeah, I actually, I think that the, the record um, new cases came out probably after the market closed. So I think that we will see the reaction to that on Monday. Probably we will open red on Monday because of the, uh, the, the new peak in coronavirus cases. All right, uh, let's talk stocks that we watched last week, Robert. What were you watching? 
So last week I called out TPOR, you know, the transportation ETF I've been talking about probably like the last month or two. It has since fallen about $1 with most major airline stocks taking hits this week after the CEO of Delta Airlines came out and said they estimated the airline industry will take about three years to fully recover from the current pandemic. Now, earlier we talked about how um, U.S. airport volume dropped a whopping 96%. So uh, three years is probably a generous uh, estimate. It may take even longer. I'm guessing it's probably going to take about five years. Um, so yeah, the CEO of Southwest was speculating four to five years might be how long it yeah. take. So United Airlines is also selling an additional 39 million shares, as we talked about earlier, which, of course, will dilute the share price of any existing shareholders. So uh, I don't expect the, this ETF to like skyrocket anytime soon. This is more of a long term investment. Uh, and uh, it's definitely not one you want to just throw all your money at. And like we said earlier, cash is king. So um definitely don't invest in t poor like me unless you you can absorb the risk what about you Chris? yeah yeah i i actually uh have been watching gold and oil tankers as i mentioned um gold gained about two and a half percent this week and the oil tanker company frontline gained about ten and a half percent this week so i pretty handily beat the market this week with uh those investments um, I also mentioned last week that I was looking for a buy point on oil and that I plan to buy some of the USL fund if oil hit $10 per barrel. Um, oil obviously did drop way below $10 per barrel, but it didn't present the buying opportunity that I was hoping for because USL is a futures fund and those futures didn't come down uh, commensurate with the oil price. So um, I did not make a buy on that this week. And frankly, after watching, I think that, you know, the futures were a major part of why the oil price collapse happened. So after watching that happen, I don't want any part really of that futures market. My, uh, my dog is attacking me right now. So if you hear any snorting on the podcast, it's, it's just my little puppy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what stocks are you watching next week, Robert? So this week. Uh, with uh, earnings week, I will be watching 3M, CBS, and Amazon. So 3M makes a lot of different products, if you're not aware. Um, they include N95 masks and various office supplies. They also, you know, make... I mean, you, you probably look at some random stuff and you won't realize how much 3M actually makes. So 3M makes a lot of stuff. So... Their exposure to this type of environment is huge because, sure, they may sell out of their N95 masks, but I don't think the sales of N95 masks and with everyone working from home, I don't think their in-home office supply sales will offset the losses they will incur from their huge line of other products that are hit, that are just sitting on shelves. So I expect 3M not to beat, expect, not to beat expectations and also to lower their forecast this year. Uh, CVS also reports this week. And I think they will have a record quarter since most retailers are closed and CVS has remained open, allowing customers to stock up on supplies that they wouldn't be able to find elsewhere or at crowded grocery stores. And finally, Amazon, which has skyrocketed since dipping down below 1700 in mid-March. It sits at 2400 right now due to many investors seeing how much sales volumes are being done since the pandemic started. It will definitely be a record quarter for Amazon, but I think investors will cause the stock to go even higher, maybe even hit the 3000 level, but then it's going to crash back down to about 2500 after the hype dies down. Yeah, I have been watching those stocks that are, you know, outperforming during lockdowns and kind of feeling some some FOMO, some envy, but on the other hand, I think once the lockdowns end, a lot of those stocks are going to come right back down. So, you know, I I I'm not speculating on them and I'm not uh, worrying too much about having missed out on those. A lot of them just look like sort of massively overvalued. Uh, Zoom is another one that, you know, is soaring. But like when I look at the valuation on it, I'm like, that's not actually worth buying. <laughs> but uh, you do sort of kick yourself for having missed out. Um, I'm expecting that uh, sometime soon the market will start correct downward. So if I see signs of that, I may experiment with uh, playing short on the S&P 500. Um, but on the long side, I'm mostly just playing the oil taker company Frontline. Um, 
I think their dividend still makes them a really great value at the current level. And I think that they will continue to rise as uh, oil prices remain weak. Um, and I'm also keeping an eye on Intel and Alibaba, both of which I think are at really good valuations. And I'm going to look to buy them if the market dips significantly um, and their valuations get even better. I think that both of those are just like really good buys at this price. All right, folks, if you heard something on the podcast here that you useful, uh, please give us a like, share, or comment on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter. Retweet us uh, to your friends. Uh, you can also like our Facebook page. Let your friends know about us on Facebook. That really helps us uh, get the word out about the podcast. We don't do any marketing for this, so it's all word of mouth, and we really appreciate your support. You can also support us financially if you would like to by going to uh, our YouTube video. And underneath the video, you'll find a link, a referral link to Webull. If you open a Webull account using that referral link, then you will get a couple of free stocks. And we also will get a couple of free stocks. And that helps us support the podcast and make more of these for you. Thanks so much for listening. We really appreciate your support. And we will see you again at the zoo next week. See you.